And I'm just so glad that you are here. This gathering is close to three years in the making. You know, the last time we had a family night were quite a few summers back. And it is a blessing to be able to gather and to study God's word in person. And for anyone who has had the experience so far of us moving back towards in-person gathering, it's a huge difference from uh, going online. And so it is wonderful to be here. I wanted to mark that as one of those items tonight. And uh, it is good to see uh, many of you here. And I pray that before you leave, you'll be able to say hello and connect with someone. Uh, we're looking at a great summer. And I'm glad for this study. I'm glad for just the layout of the studies we'll be overviewing as we go through the summer. We're going to be focusing on the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to talk about something that is a little more challenging. Uh, well, not more challenging, but is challenging in our present context today. And that is how to engage with our neighbors. And so that's going to be the second study that we're going to go in as we move through the summer. And uh, this first one is a challenge because for many of us, uh, you know, we may, depending on our, our, our church background, uh, we may not hear a lot of times focusing on uh, admiring, understanding, being challenged by who the Holy Spirit is. And so uh, tonight we, we launch into that area, and uh, we're going to do that in a little bit. Let me begin, though, with a complaint. Uh, out of all that we could have touched on about the Holy Spirit, I get the one about conviction. You know? Uh, we could have done, the Holy Spirit is love that Jesus sheds in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is, is truth and comforter. The Holy Spirit is, uh, you know, such a wonderful uh, presence of the Lord. But, but we start out of the shoot on conviction. And I'm like, wow, I'm glad we didn't promote that or the numbers would have been a lot lower tonight because no one wants to show up to, to, to get convicted. But uh, the truth of the matter is it's key to our relationship with God through this spirit who guides and directs us on how we are to have that relationship. So we're going to come back as we look at this and wrap things up in that way. But I, I do want to launch into an understanding of uh, focusing upon the, the dynamic of what this means. And so I want to give us an opportunity to, to talk a little bit. And uh, I know we are still distanced, and some have on masks, some don't, and that's okay. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to put up some questions and give us a chance to think about this area as we get started. Before we do, we're going to pray, though. I, I'm not sure uh, that uh, that was my launch point. So we're going to pray and ask God to meet us tonight and to show us a perspective of who he is and a perspective of the incredible gift he's given us because that's who the Spirit is. And so let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you and thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us, that the magnificent and incredible creator of all the world would love us so much that when we messed up, <laughs> when we continue to mess up, when we don't care about messing up, and we do it so often that you would yet push beyond our failures, our challenges, and love us. We thank you for Jesus that the, is the epitome of that love. We thank you, Lord, then uh, for giving us uh, a person that lives within us, a relationship connector. And we thank you so much for your spirit. And we pray, Lord, as we enter into your word this night, as we uh, interact with what this means, and especially as we look at his work in our world and our lives to convict us. We pray that we might leave here appreciative of your love, may, amazed by your goodness to us, and seeking to walk in a way that honors you and draw close to you. So we bless you, we honor you, we thank you for this evening. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So the questions will be put up, and uh, what I want to ask you to do is just just to uh, spend a few moments thinking about them and uh, maybe talking with one another about them. And if they're not up, I can give you what they are. Okay? All right. So let me give you what the first question is. I'm just going to tell you the first question. You can talk about that as you go. But the first question is, just, is this. Have you ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit over something that you were once fine with? Okay? Have you ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit about something that you didn't have a problem with, you were once fine with, and he just came in and messed it all up. So I want you to think about that. I want you to 
if there's someone around you, you, you got my permission to turn around from a distance and interact with someone or some group, but I want you to be able to communicate that, okay? Has there ever been a time where the Holy Spirit convict or caused you to be convicted about something that you were once fine with? Okay? Spend a few moments thinking about that. All right, if you're just coming in, we're looking at this one question. William and friend, we're glad you're here. I want to ask you to look at the question is, have you ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit about something you were once okay with, something you were once fine with? That's what you're going to be talking about. Have you ever felt as God moved on you and said, this is not something you should be okay with, and you were okay with it one time? So we want you to talk about that. Just going to give you a few minutes to talk about that. Have you ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit over something that you were once fine with? Okay? That you were once fine with. All right, let's, let's, let's bring it in before you forget it. Anybody want to share? Anybody okay with sharing? Have you ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit over something that you were once fine with? Cursing. Thank you, Raina. Cursing. All right. I can tell the church has a cursing problem. Everybody's like, thank you, sister. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Cursing. Anybody else? What's another one? William? Here. William was saying that uh, holding a grudge against a, a friend within the last two weeks, month, period of time, God has convicted him about that, that that is not how he should function and how the relationship he's in with this other individual should take place. I mean, I, I, I got to say, there have been times in my world, in my life, where I've been mad at someone, and no one else knows, not even the person I'm mad at, but you know, <laughs> you know how the Holy Spirit is, how God is. He gets in the middle of that, and next thing you know, you're, oh, I'm only here because I want to sleep. I want to eat. I want to be able to pray. And I'm going to let you go. I'm going to forgive you. But you, 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 you got you, you to gotta move into that. And so, amen. Anyone else before we move on? Robert? Amen. Amen. Robert sharing as an athlete and younger that uh, there are certain things you expect, treatments, benefits, but you're not young forever. And the uh, Holy Spirit has convicted him about a change in that outlook and that perspective. So awesome. Awesome. All right, let's move on to question number two. You interact with the same in the group that you're in. And the second question is, do you ever think the Holy Spirit's presence, you, have you ever, do you ever think of the Holy Spirit's presence when you're doing something wrong? Why or why not? Do you ever think, and yeah, you got to tell on yourself. you ever think of the Holy Spirit uh, when you're doing something wrong? Do, do, do you ever think, you know, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Holy Spirit's starting to convict you. Or, or it, it, it's immediately afterwards. And why do you think that's the case? So spend a few moments talking about that. And I didn't say this, but if you're speaking with someone and you don't know them, introduce yourself. Okay? All right? How many need more time? Feeling good about the discussion? Who's listening to me? All right. That's a good sign, so we'll go with that. Okay? All right. Ring, ring the bell. I'll, I'll do something. Scream out loud. Okay, let's, let's bring it in. Let's, let's talk about it together. Anyone want to share? Oh, we got one more question. If you want to stay over here, you can. But, um... Leonard. Leonard's being very real right now. <laughs> Went shopping. Salesperson didn't, didn't, didn't catch it. Okay. Wow. Wow. I need to go shopping with you. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, you just got an innocent looking face that they just let you walk out like that. That's a great look. I got you. Growing up, I mean, I must admit, I grew up in a place where that was a deal. That, that's all. I mean, you know, we'd come to school and talk about the people who had stolen stuff off of trains and how they'd gotten over on someone. That was just the way it was in, in New York. But, you know, amen. So got to the car and realized, no, nah, this is not right. Oh, oh. <laughs> I love the honesty. I got you. You were dancing on the way to the car, you know that? 
got the dance, the de- dance, the deal on, you know, the deal dance on. And then you realize the Holy Spirit's no, no, got to go back. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Please remind me of your first name again. It was Janice or Laura. Close. Laura. Okay. All right. So, Lord, Holy Spirit talks to you and tells you this is not right. All right. Thank you for your honesty. And, and Laura says she just tell the Holy Spirit get back. This is my time right now. I look at whoever I want to look at. Okay. All right, Vincent. <laughs> Stop, brother. I got to move away. I'm not now. Now, you're getting all personal now. We don't talk about driving up in this church. No, no, go on. Amen. 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 My wife's looking at me real hard, but uh, Holy Spirit ain't convicting me right now, so I'm going to keep on driving. No, um, yeah, we got, we got to talk about that. There are, there are times. I mean, I, you know, we, we do some things behind the wheel that the other side comes out, and uh, she's not going to leave me alone, so I got to admit, yes, that's my area as well. Um, anyone else? Okay, going places you shouldn't be. All right, and the Holy Spirit convicts you when you're there. Okay, all right, all right. She didn't say where, so I won't ask. But uh, <laughs> so now, now, no one has said why, why, or why not. You give me the why, great, and that is that is exceptional because that is sometimes very difficult to remember the why. But why are there times where we don't say why we don't go? Ayan, why are there times where, you know, uh, we are not listening or we, okay, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you need to talk to Leonard uh, because, yeah, uh, uh, mm, mm. okay, all right, all right, keeping it real. Yana said that there are times where she's gotten something and uh, did not go back. The first. And the reason was she wanted it. Reason first is that there was a decision made to engage with it. And if we're honest, we could say, yeah, there, there are times where we push, like Laura put it, push the Holy Spirit back to get to something we may want because we just want it. Lisa, uh, you so, can say? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in the middle of the, middle of the argument, middle of the conversation, you're about to say something, you know you shouldn't say something, but you are either losing it, the argument, or you just feel, but it's that good. And you just let it fly. Okay? All right. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. You don't say it's going to eat you up. All right. Priscilla. Okay. Okay. There is a struggle. And that struggle is between ourselves and our self, selfish desires and, and, and the Holy Spirit. And we sometimes choose to work on it. Let's go to number three. Number three is, why did Jesus give us the Holy Spirit if he loves us, but then have the Holy Spirit convict us? If he loves us, that's all it is. Why does he have to convict us? Okay, don't, don't, don't tell me. Talk to each other. Tonight. Just talk to each other. We won't give you as much time this time because we've got to roll into the, the, the passage we're going to be looking at. But. If he loves us, why does he have to convict us? You know? Every child knows a no is not as good as a yes. All right. All right. Let's, let's, let's bring it in. Any answers? If he loves us, why does he convict us? Jerry? Okay. The Holy Spirit as God's gift to us. God himself, third person of the Trinity, comes because we need him. I think that sums up what Jerry's saying, because we are sinners. Because we are sinners. Sonia? Conviction is part of love. Conviction is part of love. Any, anybody disagree with that? Conviction is part of love. Okay? Okay, conviction is part of love. All right. Gail? Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I want to lean into a passage. But before I lean into a passage, I want to highlight this point. And, and the point is this. Christianity is more than a philosophy. It's more than a, you know, a, a way of thinking and having a set of rules and a collection of religious practices. We can get caught in that. We can, you know, you should go to church. You should not say these things. You should say these things. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. 
And all of those, that list just gets piled on. Christianity in its core is a relationship. Okay? Christianity at its core is a relationship. Jesus came to give us a relationship with the Father. And so in any and all relationships, it becomes primary then that we understand the person we're in a relationship with. And there are times, we've all said it, I, I, I think we'll all be in agreement, that we can be very selfish. And we want our, what we want. And we want it how we want it. And this incredible God who says, I am above all, I am what you need, I am who you need, I need you to understand who I am and to come in line with it. Because then the relationship works best. So when we talk about conviction, we're talking about setting the relationship to a point where it can function. If you've got a relationship where one person's one spot and someone else is another, it doesn't go across well. It doesn't work out. You're always battling. And you may switch positions, but you've got to end up on the same page, and it's got to be a connection. So today I want to turn our attention to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John 16 is a very pivotal passage. It's a, it's a section, if you go back over to Luke 22, you'll see that Jesus speaks these words when he has been in a time of now preparing his people, his, uh, his peeps, that he's going to leave them, his group, those who've been following him. He is no longer going to be with them, and he wants to get them ready. And he's telling, he's downloading some very heavy information some very heavy truth about what's coming, and to have them be ready, he drops in the middle of that as he's telling them that I'm going to die, I'm going to, 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 uh, to, to be killed, I'm going to no longer be with you. Now remember, this is hours, not days, not weeks, not months, hours from him being taken. And in that time period, you know, what a person says in their last moments, knowing it's their last moments, matters. Many people will get things straight. Many people will confess. Many people will try to set the, the record right. But in some ways, there is this clarity of making sure the future is set and right. Jesus is setting everything straight right now. He's already told them tough times are coming. He's already told them it's going to be very difficult. And then now he must tell them something to give them the energy, the strength, the focus, the confidence to go forward. Look what he says. Verse 7 to 15. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I'm leaving. Now, I can imagine they did not believe that. They did not want to see their close friend, did not want to see their master their teacher, their leader, leave. And so they're struggling with that. How can you say that? What, what does that mean? And then he goes on. He says, the helper will not come. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He says, um, it is to your advantage that I'm leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment regarding sin, and then he begins to break down each one of those. So he doesn't even say who the helper is right now, but that word is a very key word. In the Greek, it has the understanding of, uh, it means paraclete. That, that's, the, that's the Greek word of it. it. It has the idea and the concept of a person who comes along to assist, to help. It is very much a legal term. And I can only, you know, I can only ask it this way. Have you ever watched television and you've seen the legal commercials? Okay, the, the lawyers that are out there. Uh, who comes to mind? James Scott Faring. That's one. Somebody else? Richie. Richie's another one. And, and, and you go, you just, you just list them off. All these, all these different lawyers. Why do they exist? There are some people who'd say that's the number one question in life. Why do we have lawyers? Lawyers are supposed to represent you when you go into a situation that you don't have down. You're into a context that's very different. You're in a setting where you need to understand how things flow, 
You need to be guided on what to say, what not to say. You need to be very careful on how you function in that moment because everything matters. And so a lawyer is to be the one who gives you guidance. A lawyer presents you. A lawyer helps you in a situation, in a context that is very foreign to most of us. That's what the Holy Spirit does, except it's not just in the courtroom. He does this in life because we really don't have all that we need when it comes to life. We don't have a handle on it. We don't have it all worked out. And Jesus presents the one who is going to go. He says, unless I take off, the comforter will not come. The helper will not come. The the person who will be there with you to walk with you, give you wisdom, give you guidance, will not be with you because we're going to make an exchange. And it's an incredible exchange. It's an exchange that says, I'm not going to be outside of you as another person, as my wife near me. I'm going to be inside of you. And the change I'm going to bring about is not going to be someone telling you what to do. It's going to be the feeling. It's going to be the emotion. It's going to be reading and having God's Word agree with it. It's going to be bringing that up again. It's going to be constantly communicating to you. Change, radical change, comes from the inside out. Note what he says in verse 8. He says, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, let's, let's start at verse 8. He said, I will do this, convict of sin righteousness, judgment regarding sin because they do not believe in me. He's talking about the world now. We're in a context where we're in, a, in an environment where not everybody believes what we believe, and we're seeing more of that right away. We're, we're, we're seeing people do stuff in schools that breaks our hearts. People do stuff in supermarkets that, that, that just rips our heart out. We're, we're, we're seeing things being pushed into schools, teaching. We have positions that are being taken on television programs, hearing it in music, and we realize there's something not right here. That's that helper if we trust in Jesus. He's on the inside. He is communicating constantly, letting us know how we should, what is wrong, something is not right here, how we should move. And so the first area is to, is to convict us of sin because the world does not believe in Jesus. And so it sets us right off immediately. We realize that this helper will guide us in a way that when we come into the context of our environment and how we live, that we are behind hostile territory. We don't want to think that way because we really want to get along. We really want to go through life. But it reminds us, that there are aspects of messages and positions and ways of approaching life that is not in line with God. And so he will constantly point that out. Don't do that. Don't believe that. Don't get engaged with that. Don't get engaged with them because those things do not bring the relationship together between you and God. Okay? What's the second one? Verse 9 I'm sorry, verse 10, and regarding righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you no longer are going to see me. So the standard of what's right is set. And Jesus says, he said it earlier, he says that the Holy Spirit will bring those things to mind. I'm sorry, verse 13. But when the Spirit of truth comes, the Spirit of truth, everybody wants to know what truth is today. What is right? We've got options when it comes to who you are, how you think, how you function. Everything is up for grabs. But what is truth? How do we have this relationship with a God who says, I am a God of truth? Unless we have an understanding of what that is. So it says, I will show you what righteousness is because I'm going to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I'm going to send the option to you. John 14 and verse 6, it says, And the Word became flesh. Jesus took on flesh, lived out what it meant to be God living amongst us. And dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory is uh, as of the only begotten of the Father. Okay? So when Jesus came, he lived amongst us. When the Holy Spirit comes, he lives in us. And what Jesus is trying to get them to understand, I know you're going to miss me, but what I'm going to do is going to be world-changing, life-changing, truth-changing. I'm going to die to give you a relationship with God. And when you enter into that relationship, then bang! There is truth that's going to be in you. Not just be next to you. You're not just going to see how I operate, how I handle things. No, 
you're now going to be put in context and situations when you got that ham and you're out on your way out to the car and you're doing you oh, the deal dance. And the Holy Spirit says, whoa, wait a minute. Hold on. Take that ham back. Back it on up, piggy. Take it on back. And you got to walk back and say, I want to sleep tonight. I want to eat tonight. I want to be in the right relationship with God tonight. Please ring me up. It wasn't right. That's what it means. It means that now we have the opportunity to see a standard of what's right. And it's not how you grew up. It's not how you got over in the past. It's not how others around you get over. It's you trusting God that he's got your best interests in mind, that he wants to draw close to you. And he says, when you knowingly do those things that aren't in line with me, then it pulls the relationship apart. So he's going to show us what righteousness is. What's the third one? The third one, it says, and regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. There is a judgment that's coming, verse 11, as he says that the one who is the king of this age has already been judged. And so they're not always going to like us when we live a certain way. They're not always going to be in agreement with us. And the Holy Spirit is there to comfort us and to encourage us and to strengthen us and to guide us and to continue to have us walk in a certain way to understand how we should go. Because if we don't, what happens is we lose that distinctiveness and we lose the relationship. And the relationship says that there is something important in you and about you and you cannot lose it. Because there's a world that needs to see it. There's a world that needs to see it. And so the challenge that comes, verse 12, it says, I have many more things to say to you, but your mind is blown right now. You cannot hear it. You cannot deal with it. So when I send your promise to you, the helper, he'll walk you through those things in detail. In the situations and the challenges of life, he'll teach you how you should live. But I've got to tell you ahead of time that it's going to be up close and personal, much different than you had with me. And then you will make profound, mature, challenging decisions in the midst of what you're going through. And so the Holy Spirit comes to engage us in a relationship, to make sure that that relationship is close and personal and helps us walk in it. And I, you know, let's look at verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, Again, he's not going to be false. He's not going to be lying. He's going to tell you what I believe. When he comes, he will guide you into all truth. Not just what I've taught you. Not just what you've seen in me. But now you're going to go live it. You're going to live it in the 21st century. You're going to live it in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, and your, with your family, and with your coworkers, and your school context. And it's going to be very different. But be assured, you have all you need in you. Feed the Spirit with the Word of the Spirit. And then have him feed you so you can be his person in that time to please God. Why do you say that? Well, look at the next one. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will hear it from who? He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, the one who's leaving, the one you don't want to leave, the one you're going to miss, the one you've enjoyed being around. Oh, realize He's going to bring me up close and personal to you. And when you understand that, you will take from mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. This is why I said that he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. He is who he says he is, and he comes for an incredible purpose to connect us in our relationship. But the challenge is we don't like the conviction as much. You know, we hate it, especially when we mess up. When we do what we want to do, and then we get convicted. Or we think God is going to judge us. We don't like that as much. Got to tell you a story. When I was growing up in New York, uh, I didn't always do what my parents wanted me to do. I know. It shocked some of you. And the truth of the matter is when they went off to work, we were home by ourselves. And we were latchkey uh, kids. I was the oldest. So I had to, you know, take care of my brother and sister. And sometimes we would do some stuff that was pretty dangerous. And I say that, I mean, me outside the home with other friends. And I thought, you know, mom, dad don't know what they don't know won't hurt them. Truth be told. 
And I remember doing some stuff that was just reckless and bad and against what they wanted. But I figured there's no way they're going to know. They're at work. I'm at home. I'm out with my friends. I'm okay. They'll never find out. And then they'd come home and they'd tell me exactly what I did. There were snitches in the neighborhood. They had grown folks in their house watching us, telling them what we were doing. And, and we couldn't always figure out who they were. We didn't always know. And I hated those people. Snitches should get snitches. But I didn't know who they were. And the reality of it is, in that moment, I got really upset because I was thinking, like, how did these people step into my business, telling my parents, getting me in trouble? It's none of their concern. That was back then. But I look at it now. Praise God for those snitches. Because they stepped in many times and got me taken care of and got me out of trouble. Sometimes the wrong company, sometimes the wrong situations, sometimes the wrong journey I was on. And I'm telling you, my overall view is that they kept me in the right place, in the right path, for the right reasons. And I couldn't appreciate it. Can I tell you that's what it is with the Holy Spirit? There are times where he is going to convict us about stuff that he has. We're going to just say, it's none of your business. God is okay with this. And if he isn't, then, then I'll get back to him afterwards. Or this is how it's been. My family has been this way. We always do. I've always done this. This is how I let off some steam. This is what I do to relax. This is how I get my buzz. And the truth of the matter is, he will always tell you, oh, no. Oh, no. Why? Because it messes up the relationship. And if you continue in that path, then I'm going to ask for God the Father to step in and change some things here. Because it says that the Holy Spirit speaks to the Father in terms that are not always utterable, understandable to us. And he's always having that communication of what we need how we need it. Maybe we do need a health issue. Maybe we do, maybe we do need some conflict in relationships. Maybe we, do, maybe we do need something being put out in the open. Maybe we do need that challenge. Why? Because we don't get in line with the relationship. And so that's what I want to emphasize for us tonight. I want to emphasize the fact that when we talk about this relationship that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He convicts the world of what's going on. He convicts us of a righteous standard. He convicts us of God's judgment in the world that we've got to understand there is a purpose there. And so I want to give you four areas that the Holy Spirit's work should touch our lives. Conviction and the importance of it, okay? Conviction brings about true relationships. Conviction brings about true relationships. You know, you can say you love someone. You can say that you will die for someone. You care for someone. You, you are all about someone. But when that person tells you, but you know, really, I don't really like it when you do this. I, 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 I want you to understand who I am. And I know you like doing it that way, but I got to tell you, if you like me, you'll do it this way. I got to tell you, I got an incredible sense of humor. I, I do. When I'm home, I keep this woman in snitches. I, I mean, stitches. I mean, I'm snitch. I'm Girl, I keep you cracked up. And, and, and when we're home and we're joking, she just, she just enjoys herself. But there are times where she doesn't like my jokes. She says, I play too much. And, 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 and it hurts me. And so I joke more. And typically, <laughs> the situation doesn't go well. Why? Because she's already told me what she likes. I choose not to go in line with what she likes, and it causes friction. does not cause the relationship coming close. It causes a separation. Conviction is when I realize I went too far. I know what you like. I'm talking, playing around too much, and I've got to get back in line with you. It shows us where the relationship really is. And it also moves us to say, do we care enough to change? And when we're with God in that relationship, he ain't going to change. 
He's not. We've got to be the one. And so conviction says here is how you need to change to make the relationship close. Psalm 16 and, uh, and verse, uh, verse 11, I think it is, it, it says, you know, in your, in your, in your, um, in your, uh, oh, in your hands is the fullness of life, joy everlasting, and you will make known to me life forever. To truly experience that, to experience the fullness of who God is, to experience the joy of living in relationship with him, then when he says no, we, we got to go and say, okay, no more. We want to be close. Let me give you the second one. Conviction brings about deeper relationships. Someone has issues with you without talking to you. So in communion, we're commanded to go and talk to them. You know, I, I still can think of people who for years had problems with someone else and never went to them. You cannot go deep in your relationship unless you speak truth. Speak truth with one another. Speak truth in love, Ephesians 4 tells us. Why? Because truth, again, brings you together, causes you to make some decisions that's going to connect you on a deeper level. And if there's no truth there, then there's really no relationship of depth. No relationship of depth. Because the reality is there is, there is again, I'm here, you're here, and we don't know it until we figure out something was said, something was done, and we find out it wasn't what we thought it was. So conviction is us realizing, you know, I got to come clean. I got to come clean, and I got to tell you truth. And God, for us, wants us to come clean with him. Do you know that God is a clean freak? Seriously. He is a clean freak. He loves our lives to be the way he wants it to be, immaculate and pleasing to him. Doesn't matter you can live with that mess. Doesn't matter you can, you know, leave those kind of things in your world and your life. And it's okay with me, God. You just got to put up with No. He says you got to get in line with me. Why? Because that's how the di relationship deepens when we commit to his standard, not to our standard. Remember what we said. He is the Holy Spirit of truth and he will guide us into all righteousness. Not by our standards, by his. Not by the world's standards, by his. Not by what is easy, by his standards. And so getting in line with him draws us closer to him. Let me give you another one for conviction. Conviction brings about correction. When error in action occurs, we are moved to correction. Okay? Correction is necessary because we mess up. I think a few, few of us said that. We're by all intents and purposes selfish. It's all about us. And conviction causes us to say, okay, God, I am sorry. Forgive me. There are times where God has moved me back to situations of years past. I, I remember in high school when I came to know the Lord, I mean, I, I've used this illustration before. There's a young lady across the street, and, and I, I really razzed her a lot, and it was inappropriate. I talked about just her, you know, promiscuity. I talked about aspects of her world and her life, and, and I remember coming to the Lord later on and seeing her and being convicted about what I did before I knew Jesus, and I knew I needed to go across the street. I knew I needed to go talk to her. I knew I needed to make it right, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to because I would have to put myself out there. I'd have to take that long walk across the street, ring that doorbell, open, have her open that door, and for me to say, forgive me. And I, I fought it. I fought it. And then the Holy Spirit just put the hammer down. And finally, I remember going across the street and saying it. And, 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 and I got to tell you, I, she didn't, it wasn't a profound moment. She didn't fall on her knees. She didn't start crying. She didn't say, you were the center of my world. I cannot believe you talked about me. We got to get it right now. She didn't do any of those things. She was stunned. I remember her just, just like, okay. Close the door, and I had to walk back across the street. All of that for this Holy Spirit. But what it meant for me was important. Because it was a correction of a direction I had gotten involved in. I was getting in trouble for calling people names. I had done that before. 
I ever told you the story? Uh, another guy in middle school, his name was Michael Jackson, and, and I got on him so much that Michael Jackson almost took his life. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember being called in the principal's office because I and some other guys had gotten on Michael Jackson to the point where he had tried to take his life. And, and, and I didn't know the Lord. I was upset. But if you knew Michael Jackson, I would say, you know, he had it coming to him. But then the Holy Spirit convicted me of that. Whoa. God says, we can't hang out like that. that that's got to be a part of your old world. That's got to be a part of, you know, all things are now under the cross. The blood of Jesus is dead. You've got to live for me. And so correction, when he shows you the area it's got to be in, that's what it means. But the truth of the matter is you honored Christ more than you honored your feelings. And that's what he's looking for. That draws that relationship together. Jesus is all. That means we got to get out of the way if it's true. Let me get a fourth one. The fourth one is conviction brings about holiness. Holiness. If you cannot be convicted and if you do not get in line with the convictions that God has brought into your world, you will never have that idea put on you. Holiness is a biblical term that means set apart to. But you can only be set apart to something if you're set apart from something. That means that, you know, it's the, it's the China wear that we grew up with, at least in my world. Mom had these China wear, and it never came out. Oh, oh, the day that I would walk up into her house, move into her China cabinet, grab one of her bowls, and said I was going to have cereal. Woo! She came home and saw me. Oh, no. Yeah, you woe well, unto me nothing. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'm serious. Boy, who do you, who do you, th my China? That China was for anyone she chose to use it for. Anything she chose to bring it out for. It was off limits. We couldn't walk to that room. We couldn't play in that room. And, and, and God help us if we thought we were man enough, big enough, old enough, grown enough to pull out her China and use it for anything we thought was appropriate. See, that's how God views you. You might think you can use, be used, put yourself into use for anything and everything. But he says, oh, no, you are mine. And if you are mine, then conviction convicts us when we take things into our own hands or we go away from what God wants for us. That's holiness. An old-fashioned term with an incredible truth because it reminds us how special we are. And so God calls us to be holy, set aside from the things that, 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 you know, you're not common. You're not common. Don't let anybody use you in a way or anybody think of you or you end up being, you, being uh, allowing yourself to go in a way that, that is like everybody else. Remember what he said, judging the world for sin. So you can't just be like everybody else. You are special and set apart and you are so important that it is like me using my mom's china when you allow yourself to be taken for granted. Just a television show, just a movie. Yeah, they're using those bad words. Yeah, they're doing those things. Yeah, I went along with it. Yeah, I said the same as they. Yeah. And he says, no. You're holy. Be holy as he is holy. You are that valuable. And so the relationship comes. So the conviction of, of the Holy Spirit is what reminds us you're special. You're special. You're special. Don't short sell yourself. Don't underestimate how valuable you are. Remind yourself, get in line with me because you're that important to God. And so when we talk about the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about, as he says, it is better for you that I go away because when I go away, you will have this incredible encounter with God that will be up close and personal. It will be in you. It will move through you. It will guide you in all of these special ways, and it will challenge you. And so I'm not looking for perfection, he says, because none of us can be perfect. But I am looking for a heart 
that is sold out to be engaged with me, to be in love with me, to have just the greatest joy to be in my presence. And the way that happens is when the Holy Spirit knocks on your, your heart, on your mind, in your life, and says, no, let's do this because this is what the Father wants. And so in many ways, I praise God for being able to do this study. I've never looked at conviction that way before. For me, conviction is always that feeling that I did something wrong, and I'm waiting for the hammer of God to come down. And I'm trying to get it right real quick. Sometimes after I knowingly did what was wrong. But the key in the matter is this. He calls us into a relationship. And if we honor the relationship, then the Holy Spirit will convict us, remind us, guide us, correct us, and bring us into that close and intimate embrace with himself. Okay? I want to pray for us. Uh, I am not looking to get us down tonight. I'm looking to pick us up. I'm looking to have you, us remember that conviction is not because we're so bad. No, conviction is because we're so good with the Spirit of God in us. And he desires for us to walk with him. If you're here tonight, you've never trusted in Jesus. You've maybe been around church, maybe been around things of God, maybe know his name, but you've never given your life to him. I want to let you know that God loves you. He says that even though we have sinned, gone our own way, done our own thing, and walked away from him, he loved us so much that he gave us an answer. His name is Jesus. Jesus came to live, to die, and to be resurrected to bring us into that relationship with God. And the way we enter into that relationship is to give up on trying to earn his love and his favor, and we say, Lord, we surrender. We believe that we are indeed as you say we are, that we are enable, un, um, incapable of being good enough. And we accept your gift to us. And we give our lives to Jesus. We give up trying to work our way, and we take on what he has done for us. And that's how we become a child of God. That's how we become a Christian. And then the gift of the Holy Spirit is in us. And that's how we then live it out. So I want you to consider. I want you to consider this. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray. And then I want you to ask God to work with you grow you, strengthen you in the area. You'll consider, might be talking to somebody else who's a little older, further along in the, in, in the walk of faith. But ask him. And then, see what he says in, through your life. Show me, create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew your spirit in me. And he wants to do your stuff. Let me pray for us, and I pray that you'll have a great night afterwards. Father, we bless you and thank you so much for your love and your grace to us and your favor. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the establishment of that relationship. Thank you that he came and lived, but thank you that he died and he left us. He left us so we might receive the great gift of your spirit, someone who now walks with us. And Father, help us to walk in such a way to honor your name and to magnify you and to please this one. May we not grieve the spirit, Lord, but may we get in line with it. And I pray in areas of each of our lives where we are struggling to do just that, that you will correct us, you will guide us, and that you will continue to encourage us, that we might live to please you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Blessings on you. Have a great night.